So um, I'm Rob Waller. Um, welcome, everybody. It's really good to see old friends coming and some new people as well. Um, particularly want to welcome Max. Uh, Maxwell Roberts is a lecturer in, he lectures in psychology at the University of Essex. And he's um, so he's one of these people who has a, 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 a really wide range of interests and expertise. And it's been so interesting watching him publish, I think it's four books by now, as well as various papers on um, uh, on, on, on the tube map. Are all the books on the tube map, Max? I can't remember. But I know the the unraveling the, um, the underground map book very well, because I think I did a review for it a few years ago. Um, Max doesn't just talk about the the, the map. He he does the most amazing uh, visual experiments with with the data from the map, and has produced all sorts of um, applied different grids and different schemas to, uh, to to the London Underground map. And um, it's it's ninety years, I believe, pretty much to the to the month since the map was launched in London in nineteen thirty three. And um, although I believe the client was fairly sceptical about it, it was an instant success and they had to uh, reprint the, the original print run of, was it 7 or 8,000 maps very, very quickly. And it's become um, an information design icon. So Max, you'll probably introduce yourself a bit better and a bit more than I have. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, people, if you use chat to, um, uh, to add any questions, we're, we're going to have quite a lot of questions, question time afterwards. Please put your questions in chat if you can, uh, and that makes it easiest for, easy for us to move from the from the talk in, into chat. Um, please um, keep yourself muted when you're not talking as well, and don't forget to unmute if you have a question later. So, Max, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, it's good to be um, back in action again. Okay, so let's just sort of give a bit more back, give a bit more of my background first of all. Um, I'm what's known in my trade as a cognitive psychologist, and I have been for uh, far, far too long. And my research has always been about how people interpret and represent information. So how people make sense of the world, um, complicated place. And as a result of... Um, the complexities of the world, people sometimes find it difficult to interpret it, difficult to represent it, difficult to decide what to do next. So again, as a cognitive psychologist, I'm interested in when things go well and when things go badly and people start making mistakes. And I'm particularly interested in sort of inference, how people draw conclusions, Obviously, the way in which you represent information can affect the conclusions you draw, um, reasoning and problem solving. I'm interested in why people differ from each other. Um, why are some people more successful at tasks than others, both from a quantitative point of view, you know, how much intelligence or whatever ability they've got, and from a qualitative point of view, um, people's differences in approaching problems. And um, also interesting something called metacognition, which comes into this topic in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, metacognition is people's awareness of their thinking processes. You know, people are aware of what they're doing and their awareness or lack of it of when they're going, going wrong. So generally that's what I research into. Um, and of particular interest today, I've developed an interest in schematic maps um, of, uh, I, 1999 I created my first map. Um, um, it's sort of a hobby that intruded into my professional life. I collected these things and uh, started forming opinions about why some maps in my collection were nicer than others. And then I put my psychologist hat on and said, well, let's, let's think about this. You know, why do maps get schematized? How does this help the user? And you know, do we have to accept the maps which are given to us? You know, could there be different? You know, can we make them better or can we make them worse? That's a 
um, why I don't want to make things worse. Well, there's, there's all sorts of research reasons why you would want to do that. Okay, so what we're talking about today is Henry Beck's map, um, first published in 1933, although first designed a couple of years later, it took a while to get that published by the underground. So if we look at what people had in January the 1st, 1933, that's a map designed by F.N. Stingemore, sort of a topographical map with some scale distortion to fit, to fit the extremities into the, into the network. Um, yeah, it, it served its purpose for over, um, over 10 years, but then Henry Beck's design in 1933 changed everything. And ever since then, you know, if you go to a shelf in a railway in an underground station, you'll, with a couple of exceptions, you know, the map that you pick up will be designed in exactly the same design rules. Not necessarily the same design, but definitely the same design rules. And London was one of the first networks to fully schematize. And obviously, you know, the schematization has continued for 90 years now. It's um, you know, it's the um longest lived way of depicting a network you know, in the world. So why was this design successful? And what you find is that if you quiz people about this from all walks of life, you find that there's sort of different points of view about why this map was special. And there's one sort of view you can sort of get from people, which is that the way in which the map just means only certain angles permitted, horizontal, vertical, and 45 degree diagonals. And Beck's map was an example, an early example of a network shown in that way. Okay, now there's people out there, and there'll be people in this room, um, who one believe that Beck invented octilinearity and also might believe that this is a design rule gold standard. If you design your schematic map in this way, then design rules you can possibly use to show a schematic map. That's not a strong map. Strongly indicates um, quite a large proportion of people out there believe that, that you know, this is the correct way to design a map. Uh, Berlin S bar map from 1931, and there's all sort of similar schematizations which preceded Beck's design, and not a gold standard either in research that we've done. You know, there's the official Paris Metro map here. Here's a curvilinear design which I tested against it. And in the case of Paris, one of the most consistent usability findings you get, the curvilinear version wins every time. It's faster for planning journeys. If people take 30 seconds to plan a journey on the official map, they'll take 25 seconds to plan just as a journey on either in terms of the usability tests we've applied to it. Okay, so not special because Beck invented straight lines um, or the right straight lines. Why is it special then? Well, it's special because Beck implemented within the constraints he created, he implemented the design rules magnificently. Okay, it's not that the design rules were clever, it's that Beck's work within the design rules was absolutely splendid. And with nothing else to go on, um, you know, no other designs to sort of inspire him, he just pulled this out of the hat. And what I've tried to over the years is just evolve criteria for effective design, not a theory of design, 
but trying to identify what schematic maps need in order for the designs to function well. And I've always argued that, you know, this wasn't just an early schematic network map, you know, Beck nailed all the criteria for effective design at his first attempt, which is no mean feat. So I'm just going to run through the criteria for effective design by comparing what Stingemore did for the area around Paddington with what Beck did. And what I'm going to do is show what Beck did and show just how much worse it could have been. And I can point towards maps making mistakes. Um, so the first criteria for effective design is simplicity of line trajectories. You know, the schematic map is supposed to help people by making the lines easier to follow. That means simple, straight lines. It would have been so easy to have taken geographical reality and sort of try to mimic it with um, complicated line trajectories. And there's no point doing that. You've not simplified reality. All you've done is change the shape of the complexity. And what Beck did, you know, he, he nailed it. He simplified the line trajectories, turned the complex twisting, turning large reality into simple straight lines. Beck chose a set of design rules that made it easy for him to give the lines the overall design coherence. Coherence is sort of higher order properties of the map, how the lines relate to each other. Parallel lines, um, parallel lines, um, symmetric divergence, you know, aligning, aligning stations, and, and, and so on. And you know, if Beck had chosen different design rules, that might have been so much harder. So, you know, if he'd chosen not octolinearity, he might have had, you know, design rules where nothing's really parallel. And that's, you know, Beck didn't do that. His design much more effective than that. Okay, harmony is a more sort of subtle thing. It's to do with the aesthetic um, pleasingness of the map. And, you know, Beck could have chosen design rules that, um, had lots of parallel lines, coherent design, but still not very attractive. Um, for instance, you know, if he chose an angle slightly off with, with crossings not perpendicular, that would have damaged the aesthetics of the map. And Beck also came with a balanced design, even spread of stations across the page, no pockets of high density and emptiness. And Beck did all of this without destroying the shape of London. You know, his map of London actually wasn't, his first map wasn't very geographically distorting. You know, he didn't actually move stuff around in such a way as it conflicted how, with how people saw the London. So not only did he come up with a novel map, you know, he, he implemented it very nicely, simple line trajectories, coherence, aesthetic design, a balanced design, all without conflicting with Londoners' mental models, you know, the perfect way to introduce people to a new mapping technique. So the reason Beck's map was special was because it was an unusually good design that adhered to all the criteria for effective design. It's so easy to create maps that don't adhere to these criteria, and ultimately they end up causing problems for the user. And yeah, Beck's map was rejected, but I suspect it was because management was a bit just didn't have the attention to focus on his map. And when you look at what London Transport was doing in the 1930s, you know, the way they were pushing architecture onto sort of you know, simple modernist boxes, you know, a rather fussy, um, a rather fussy pseudo geographical map just wouldn't have looked right in the con context of those buildings. It's almost as though they put these stations up. And as soon as they did, they realized that these stations actually needed a new mapping technique in order to you know, harmonize with them. And that's not entirely speculation because when you delve into the um, London Transport Archive, photo archives, you find wonderful photographs like this one from 1932, 
where they are um, putting a um, you know putting a line diagram on the front of the station and you know all those horizontal lines and then the map just fits into that perfectly. Okay, so Beck's legacy, it's not a simple one of the of, you know, design rules he mapped. His legacy is actually just how carefully he applied those design rules within the criteria. And you know, if you want to create the best schematics possible, you need to understand Beck's success, not just use octolinearity, but think about you know, creating the best map within those constraints. So the choice design rules is only the first step. You need to implement effective design criteria within those design rules, balance conflicting priorities because you know, the, on the one hand, you've got the geographical chaos of London. On the other hand, you've got the need to simplify. Try and apply your solution consistently and always be aware of the user. Okay, now we get to the map today and I would say that TFL design, despite the claims on it, disrespects Beck's legacy. Now, this is the online map, the PDF you can download. Um, to see the true horrors of where TFL mapping has got us to, to today, you need to pick up the paper card folder off a station. And this ghastly thing fails every criteria for effective design you can imagine. It doesn't simplify line trajectories. You know, look at all these horrible twists and turns. And then you know, why does Hackbridge dive down like that? It doesn't simplify line trajectories. It's geographically crazy in places. There's a really good reason why that station there is called North Acton. And it's north of Acton main line. Um, the whole of uh, West London sort of spacewalked because you know they couldn't be bothered. You know they just crayoned in the new Elizabeth line rather than try and think about sort of a new map that integrates it nicely into London. And East London is just as bad as well. Um, Shoreditch High Street, miles away from Liverpool Street, um, and yeah, and the Bethnal Green stations. Um, way, way distorted. And geographical accuracy matters much more these days than it used to for several reasons. Um, I sort of talk about that in the questions. But this design, you know, every, everywhere you look at it, the balance of the design, you know, it's sort of empty voids here and crushed up space here. It's unbalanced. It's, um, it's, complex line trajectories, it's geographically crazy. Um, you know, it's, it's failing every way. Um, not surprising because the, the size of this map is exactly the same as this map. The physical paper size of these two maps is identical. The size of the map you collect from a station is exactly the same as 1933, but with a lot more stations on the modern map. Okay, so let's just round off then, um, because um, the TFL design it disrespects Beck's legacy, it fails all the criteria for effective design. And yeah, what's it say on the corner? This diagram is an evolution of the original design conceived in 1931 by Parry Beck. Um, I actually think Beck would be horrified to have this name attached to this map. Everything we know about how he went about designing maps, how he worked, what he tried to do, everything, the way in which Beck worked is the sort of antithesis of the way in which this design has been put together. Okay, so that's. 3.20, so I guess that's time for me to um, say um, thank you very much. <laughs> I sense you've got more to say there. Uh, didn't you have more, more slides? But um, 
Yeah, it depends on the questions. I've, I've, I've got, okay. if, someone, if someone asks me a question and I've anticipated a few questions I might be asked, I can pull a slide up to show you. Okay. I have, yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. Clive. Uh, Clive Richard. Uh, thank you much for, for, for that presentation, um, uh, illuminating presentation. And I, I'm interested to know that you talk about Harry Beck's rules, Henry Beck's rules. Simplicity, coherence, harmony, balance. Top. Now, uh, would I be correct in saying actually that's probably Max Roberts' rules derived from Henry Beck's maps? Or do you think, or do, is there evidence that he actually had a set of rules along those lines which he followed? Or do you think it's more likely that he was acting kind of, as it were, intuitively in producing the map that he did? I, th I think, yeah. The yeah, these I, I call these more sort of you know, priorities rather than rules because you don't uh -huh. have to keep. You know, you, you could break. You know, the, the the basic design rule is ultralinearity. That's the design rule that Beck worked to, and you can't break that. But these are the principles. Okay, no, Beck didn't have these in his head. Um, he might have. You know, he might have had wanted to create a balanced design across the page, you know, the, the station names are nicely. No, but Beck created a design that conforms to, that conform to these. Hmm. You know, this, this, is my, this is my visual language for making sense of designs. Right. And as a result of sort of seeing a lot of designs, you know, these are the sorts of criteria that you need to work for in order to create a good design and Beck happened to have enough natural design flair to just create a map that conformed to all of these. I think that was that's my answer you, you talk about natural design flair so yeah. he, he didn't he didn't systematically have this this checklist to work to this is well, um, he, he wanted we know he wanted to simplify line trajectories right and the way in which he went about working meant that he was going to have a balanced design. Um, in terms of harmony, visual aesthetics and coherence, less likely. Um, in terms of topographical distortion, that's something every map designer is conscious of. You know, what can how, how do we know? Of? How do we know the, about the line trajectory things? He he actually said that, did he? he wrote that somewhere. Was that one of Ken yeah. Garland's interviews with him, perhaps? Yes, that's in his book. Right. Okay. Um, and can I squeeze in one further question, um, if I may? Uh, I was wondering about harmony, naturally aesthetically pleasing. That's that's an interesting one for a cognitive psychology psychologist i think um what there, I there, there, <laughs> there is a cycle oh, we lost sound um there's no i'm still here oh okay. good we lost your sound for a moment yeah okay um right this this category harmony that, that's really a sort of a bucket place to put visually uh, the visual appealingness of designs which are unlikely to impinge on usability and it's trying to account for the fact that you know people like maps you know they, they, they don't just say this map works really well people say people you know, they put these maps up on their walls and they, they pay me money to print out useless maps to put on their walls. I sell posters online. And so you know, there's obviously a visual appeal for these maps that goes beyond or even usurps um, the, um, the uh, usurps um, the essentials of usability. And, you know, the, the you know, this package is important because you know when people decide to use whether a map or not, if it's something they like, if it looks nice, they're more likely to use it than if they think it looks horrible. Now, the thing about harmony, aesthetic, um, the aesthetic aspects of the map, um, there's going to be individual differences in there. 
I know there's going to be individual differences because, you know, in, in my, I, I mentioned I deliberately create bad maps and it, even the worst maps I've created still have a following out there. Maps are designed to be really, really nasty. You'll be, you'll be amazed the sorts of maps that people I create that people say this is this is wonderful so it's it's a rather awkward little category but you know I think you know if we had a little vote and said you know does this map succeed you know did did Beck's map succeed aesthetically as well as from a usability perspective you know I, I don't think there'd be many people in the room who'd say no it doesn't succeed aesthetically Max, I wanted to pick Thank up you. on the same, on, the, on a similar point because when you were critiquing the uh, the more recent map, you 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 criticised it because it was unbalanced and there was white space that was that was unused, and I was quite curious about that because it um, it, it seemed I sense sometimes you, you're a bit critical of designers who don't perhaps have reason behind them and just choose aesthetic solutions. And so I was quite surprised to sort of see, oh, look, there's a bit of a gap there that could have been more even as if the ideal map has information sort of evenly spread over the page, which is an aesthetic principle rather than, as you say, a usability one. Or, I mean, maybe we could segue this question into, into the point you made about geographical accuracy at one point you thought you, we might return to yeah. in, the, um, I, in the questions. I disagree that it's just aesthetic. You know, if you look at... You know, these four stations here, for instance, you know, they're packed together really tightly on the map. They, they, that's a very dense piece of information here. You know, dense information is going to attract people's attention. You know, those one, two, three, four stations are just as close together, just as walkable as those four stations. So are you saying yeah. close is better because they're walkable, whereas the ones you've just ringed on the, yeah, that, the northern line, um, it, that's misleading because they, they are in fact walkable, but they look miles apart. Um, that's that will mislead people, yes, but it's also, you know, it's yeah, you, you've got this huge empty space down here that's not geographically and it's not schematically just tight and you've got this incredibly tight bunch of stations up here which is not geographically and not um not psychologically that, justified isn't that a function of the system so in the bottom right one isn't it stretched so that the northern line can sort of meet the vertical bit you know at the bottom of the where they, where, where they come together. I I'm, I'm not quite sure what your suggestion would be about how to add more space at the top left and have less at the bottom right. Um, okay, what well, your suggestion? That's our <laughs> suggestion. I mean, I think I, I think you were right, absolutely ah. right, when you said opinions will differ over aesthetic criteria. I mean, there is another criteria you might uh, criterion you might lob in there, and that's monotony. I mean, the more evenly spread out all the lines and stations are across the page might look rather monotonous than the, the change in rhythm that you see from having areas where there's nothing to where there are areas of, of some density, which some people, for instance, might find aesthetically pleasing. So you, think, you are right on I that think, point. <laughs> I think you're clutching at the straws there. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm, a, I'm agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying you are right. Opinions will differ. <laughs> yeah, no, but you know, you're also saying that this map is boring, and so it's going to be less usable. Uh, sorry, no. am I saying what? Yeah, if you're by, by implication, you're saying... I think that's quite nice. I don't know. You said it's. <laughs> it's no, what what I said was, I, what I said was that if if all the stations and lines were as it were evenly distributed, so there was um, there was very little empty space as it were, it would lead to something which some people some people might regard as visually monotonous, 
whereas there's a nice variety on the one i'm now looking at here there's a nice variety of um of lines and spaces which is i think aesthetically quite pleasing right isn't it that that this if everything was even you wouldn't have the memorable shapes that you have here and one i don't i don't think you could get perfect evenness as a goal i think what Good. the problem is yeah. with the tfl map is that you know the, the lack of evenness is so extreme that it's sort of it's actually distorting the way in which you perceive the map psychologically you know, people what's, wrong, what's wrong here is that it's too crowded there's too much on it isn't isn't, mm -hmm. isn't there something else that's wrong here which is that it it's about its level of complexity although actually i have a, another issue which is about how this builds in the culture so um if you if you had introduced this straight away in 1933 it would be ridiculous but the fact that we've well sorry the fact that londoners or the people in the uk have kind of certain people of my age who've known this map for many decades and it's grown gradually i can see the original sort of through through the modern one and so right you've just changed it yeah so what you've lost there the color is my central anchor is the central line is that kind of thermos flask shape that you get from the central line being yellow and inversions where it's not yellow i no longer orient myself around the map that well rather like when at one point i think they removed the river didn't they and everybody protested because they felt the river kind of anchored everything um in their in their heads yeah i've put this map up unfortunately i can't show you a color version because beck never created a color version but this is um beck's 1938 i think he created it his map of all london's railways and he makes a far nicer job of taming the complex network than the current tfl map does and if you put the two maps next to each other you realize that complexity needn't be needn't result in um you know threatening looking maps that you know that it's possible to um you know if you if you're conscientious enough about it you can fit in lots and lots of railways without sort of making a horrible mess of it you know if, you know the people who creating the tfl map today with all the extra railways on it they would do well to go back to the 1930s and look at the next attempt to actually tame the, the massive london railway network uh, that's, that's that's the trouble that it's it's very hard to judge a map by itself you, you have the map in front of you is it a good map is it a bad map well you, you don't really have much to compare it with you, know, you you need to sort of see lots of attempts at the same network and develop a sort of critical language for sort of trying to make sense of the differences between designs in order to begin to sort of um you know evaluate whether you know certain maps in front of you are succeeding better than others can i ask if anyone else has any questions we've got remarkably few questions uh this week this month People, people who haven't been to London, what, what's your view of this? Or people, people who have just been to London once, what did you think of the map? Also quite interested, um, Max, in picking up on your comments on, on the Paris map, where uh, you say the Beck system didn't work. Anybody from Paris commenting on that? No, okay. <laughs> I, the thing, the trouble with the Paris map is that um, the, the problem with the Paris map is line trajectories primarily. It's, it's been designed to sort of be pretty well geographically close to reality. So every station is where it should be. But you know, when you look at the complexities of lines, you know, follow one line from end to the other, you really see that is you know, line four you know, it's 
it's it's it's a very sort of complex shape it's hard to follow and where it joins other lines yes it gets quite hard to follow the trajectories through um you can do a better job of paris within those design rules you know within the Beck design rules you can make a better job of paris um but um in this particular case you know the curvilinear map you know, does a succeeds much better at showing the shape and what i say to people is right you know paris has got the line two line six orbit here here's the orbit on the map now let's look for it on the even when you know you're looking for it you can still barely see it <laughs> on the official map there's so much complexity here it's taking away from the structure of the network that's interesting but veronica yeah. you've got a comment about paris in the, in the chat do you want to come in on that Well, I, I just wanted to ask why why the curvilinear map um, perform, performed so well, and uh, the answer is the, the, the geography is much better represented. Did I get that correctly? Um, it's a little less geographically. You can see it's broadly similar. There's a few places where um, with you know, like like. Uh, hang on, let's get the pen up. You know, if you see what I've done here and here, um, I've sort of gently you know, curve things away from each other to make them sort of more distinct. And what I've tried to do with the curvy map is try and you know, simplify the line trajectory. So although you've not got the organization of the sort of Beck rules, you can at least see what each line is is doing in terms of you know where it's heading to and how it's connecting together um there are you know, i think that although this study shows the curvilinear map wins it's not a fair comparison you can't take the data i've got and say it curvilinear is correct for paris you know the, the underlying logic of the curvilinear map was that you know Given the complexity of the line trajectories on the official diagram, maybe the net Paris network with its sort of um, the structure of the network means that you can't get a good octolinear design for that. In which case, let's try a curvilinear design where all the uh, sort of complex changes of the direction, all the zigzags are smoothed away. So that was the logic of the curvilinear map for Paris that. If, if we can't have simple trajectories with Beck's rules, maybe simple trajectories with curves instead will give us an easier to use map. That, that's why I created that map. But you know, I tried very hard to have simple curves on this map, whereas the design of the Paris, the official Paris map, didn't try very hard to avoid zigzags. And you know, so you're not quite comparing you know, the same design priorities across maps of, of simplicity. Um, but what, what this does show is that, you know, you, London rules won't necessarily give you the best performing map. You know, a badly designed Paris map, even though it follows London rules, will not do as well as a Paris map breaking the rules where the designers try to optimise the map carefully for certain criteria. Just a little side note. The, what what the oh, linear sorry. map for London? Um, it, London doesn't need it in the same way Paris does. London's got a much more sort of focused network. You know, everything goes inside the circle line. You know, the Jubilee line, the Bakery line, just about every single tube line visits each other inside. Whereas the Paris map is a much less focused and much less connected so for instance if we take line three up here and we take line one here and we take line 10 down here they never ever say hello to each other and you know, that, that creates a different style of network to the 
London network. And I'm a very firm believer in sort of looking at the city and saying, what do design rules tell you about the best way to design the city? And Cologne's a great example for that. Um, a few years ago, we were sort of discussing city structure and what it says to you. And I said, let's pick a network at random and just look at a map of the city and say, well, what design rules should we use? So we picked Cologne just because someone in the room was from Cologne and we found a railway geographical railway map and we put it on the screen. We said, oh, OK, um, this is really easy. Um, problem solved. This is a network based on concentric circles. You know, the structure of the city is concentric circles. You know, if you don't do concentric circles for your map, then you're actually taking the schematic away from the shape of the city. And so that's the map I created on the basis of what the shape of Cologne was saying to me, concentric circles. And the people of Cologne agreed because this is their new network map. Hmm. Go on. Hmm. Uh, just, 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 just a, a, a technical note here. What, you, you design all these maps. What tool do you use when you're you're making your maps? What I, software tool. I just use a vector graphics package. It's like Illustrator, but it's not okay. so heavy with features. Um, there's no point me telling what it's called because unfortunately it's now defunct. So unless unless you buy an obsolete Macintosh and you track down a <laughs> copy of the software and a um, and get a a licensed code, you won't be able to use it. But it creates PDF files, and PDF files will never be obsolete. So I, I keep going. But it's it's a vector graphics package with some nice, it's got some nice grid align features and some nice stacked point features, and it's Bezier curve editing is pretty oh, good as well. Right. So if, if you get a vector package with great ways of aligning things, um ways of locking objects together on their um, handle points and good Bezier editing, then that's all you need to design good maps. Okay. Um, can I come in, go back to the chat and uh, a couple more questions. Sharon, I think um, you're asking about design decisions. Um, and I think actually the discussion we've just had has probably pretty much answered your question, although not necessarily just in relation to, to the London one. I hope you don't mind if I move to Claudine's question, which is about map reading skills so it's about how with technology hand walking us to where we need to go like google maps the current london map is overwhelmingly complex any thoughts on the level of map reading skills required for a generation who do not read maps at all if that's true <laughs> um i've heard i can't remember who said this to me um which is a shame because it's a lovely quote to attribute to whoever told it to me. It might have been David Sheriff. I've, the one third, one third, one third rule, which is that one third of people like maps and timetables and use them at every opportunity. One third of people don't really like using maps and timetables, but if you give them a really, really well-designed product, they can be persuaded to use them. And one third of people hate maps and timetables and will never ever use them, no matter what you do. Um, in the what do they real do, world, what do, what, I'm, I'm sorry. What do they do? Do they just follow the signs or ask the way? Or how do they get ask, around? In the old days, they would ask for help. They'd ask for help, ask for directions, yes. follow signs. Um, but these days, they're their phones will tell them what to do as long as the battery doesn't run out or they, they lose reception, um, which I've been in parts of central London where you do lose reception and then you, you get a bit stuck because you actually can't pull the information you need up in real time to work out where you need to get off the bus you're sitting on. Um, yeah, very disorientating. Um, there's research that suggests that people rely on um, rely on devices don't develop city skills which is fine if you're just visiting a city for a weekend but if you live there then you know just letting your phone tell you where to go is actually sort of blocking your learning of it now that suits some people what i get really sort of cross about is when 
I don't, I, I get my choice taken away from me. You know, I, I think that every transport undertaking should be catering for everyone in the best way possible. You know, so they should be providing outstanding apps for people who really just want to be told what to do and outstanding maps for people who actually want to use their heads and learn about the city while they're doing it. You know, if I was in a, you know, I was in a railway, large railway station in Germany. So I was saying to them, can I get a map of German railways, please? And they, they just sort of looked at me completely puzzled and say, I said, well, no, we, we don't do a map of Germany anymore. Um, you should use the app. But I hate that. I hate the way that you can be traveling across Germany by high speed train without any idea whatsoever where you are. You know, if something goes wrong, what part of Germany have I got stuck in? I found that really disorientating. So I think there's a huge case to be made for diversity of information provision so that you know, people who think in different ways and need different levels of information can get what they want and not be told, no, you have to think in this way. We're not going to let you think in this other way. I think that's very important. And I think the problem with TfL is that totally lazy they they i had a conversation with someone who's literally at the top and his attitude was basically that the underground app is a piece of corporate wallpaper we put it on stations for reassurance but nobody uses it people just use the journey planner you know, to which my response is, I'm not surprised that no one uses this when it looks so horrible and it's so badly designed. But you know, the, the, the top of TfL is, you know, they pretty well committed themselves to the information technology route. They, you know, they're not interested in old fashioned methods of cartography, which is why the map has sort of been neglected the way it has for the last you know, 20 years. I, I'll say a bit more about my design. Yeah, what I wanted to do was do what Beck did. Okay, how do we know how Beck works? Well, we know that Beck likes simplicity because he absolutely hated Hutchison's map, um, which replaced him. And he produced a series of prototypes for London, which included the Victoria Line. And look at what he did for the Victoria Line. He made it absolutely dead straight. And here's another version, dead straight, apart from Wolf here, which is good because Wolf and so is practically at Woodford anyway. So for so, people who don't know, the Victoria line was added, what, in the 1960s, was it, when Beck was still 66. around? 66. It's the same, yeah. Victoria line's the same age as me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. These were Beck's responses to Hutchison's design. These were Beck saying, you know, I can do better than the awful map you just published. And you can just look at these maps and see that his priority was saying, take the brand new line and fit it in as cleanly as possible. So it looks like it was always there. You, know, you, you can tell what's going in his head by the designs that he creates. So now we go back to the London map. Let's look at what they've done with Crossrail. And let's look at the computer map because that's what they consider to be the best they can do. And you know, look at what Crossrail does. Here it is at Ealing. Then it bends. Crossrail is another oh. new line that was added yeah. in the last few years. So I've, I've lived, yeah, I've lived, taken too much for granted here. Apologies for that. But at least I can draw it in and show you. So and bending down and then bending up again and then couldn't quite make its mind that's got to end there and then look at you know it goes up to Shenfield pretty cleanly but then look at what's happening down here in Docklands look at this mess I mean, that's okay so you look at that and say well underground that's a difficult design this is TFL maybe they're doing the best they can do well not really so okay try and keep that map in your heads and let's look at what I tried to do. And I'm not saying this is the correct map. I'm just saying, well, this is what I could do in a couple of weeks in my spare time. Um, and these things are possible. 
We can't find it now. Where's it hiding? Have you um, there it is. There it is. Okay, so what have I done? Okay, so well, look at Heathrow there. That's you know, you'd have to be a very sort of confirmed TFL supporter to say that 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 this is better. <laughs> um, then I get it straight across into Paddington, which is geographically correct. It's following the Great Western Main Line out of Paddington. It follows a straight line through West London. And then, okay, we've got Acton North Main Line nicely south of North Acton there. So that's all right. Then a straight route across London. And then, and this is all geographically correct. This is all spot on. I tried to, you know, I, I try to keep all the sort of station relationships right on this map. So Bethnal Green is correct as well there. And then off it goes to Shenfield this way. And then a nice clean, that's as clean as you can get it down to Abbey Wood. And I think if Beck looked at this map and looked at the TL map, he'd say, yeah, this is the map that's sort of trying to do things the way I try to do things. You know, let's take this brand new line slicing across London and let's make it look like it belongs there. Can I ask about um, issues of real estate, the, the available real estate for making maps, and, and this uh, link that you have talked about where we have uh, um, things that exist both in printed paper form and things which exist on screen. And I just wondered whether you'd looked at what principles might be available for screen-based um, maps, particularly when you've got a very small screen, for example, as on a, uh, an iPhone. And I'm thinking about zooming and panning um, facilities, which, which possibly might require, I don't know, a, a, a sort of an addendum it, to, to Beck's rules. Yeah, it's not something I've thought about in great detail, you know, optimizing uh -huh. design for small screens. Um, it's something that's definitely important to look at because small screens are here to stay until we get holographic projections onto walls and things. So yeah, I, th there is mileage there. It's not something I've explored myself. I, I would sort of say that a good map on paper is also likely to be a good map on a small screen. Um, I guess I'm sure that's right. Stuff, the clever stuff would be, you know, can the map sort of shift about and change its representation, its emphasis, according to which map you're zooming into on, on the screen and whether it's portrait and landscape format. You know, could you get, is there a way of getting sort of self-redrawing schematics that can repurpose themselves to make best use of where you're looking at the map? And the size and orientation of the screen you're looking at that would be clever um that's that's beyond me i'm far too much of a non-programmer to even think about going down that route but yeah that would be a really nice route to take i was taken by your comment about the high-speed train and not knowing where you were uh from the um um presumably the the the, the more linear straightforward tabular representation of stations or, or whatever it was that was on your app that you were looking at in germany it was nothing. I bought a ticket online from Cologne <laughs> to Berlin, and it said, "Here's here, the, here your trains go to this station, change here, go to this I station," see. and that's it. That's it. Okay. Um, yeah, it's because because this was Germany, it was all sort of nice and precise. So it's at each station, it told me not not just the time of the train, but exactly which platform it would go from. Um, but yeah, there's there's a huge amount of trust involved in terms of you know, your your itinerary really will turn out to be um be what we say. It makes sense on an aircraft because there's not a huge amount you can do from one airport to another. But you know, trains are different, and the number of times a train gets diverted or breaks down or yeah, you know, or gets very late. 
and you need to think about doing something else. And you know, the, the sort of the airline information design mentality doesn't transfer to railways very well, even high speed ones. Thank you. Hey, Max, um, we're getting to um, really the end of our allotted time. So unless anyone else has questions, one or two people are starting to have to go now. Um, I think this may be a good time to sort of say thanks very much. Thanks for fascinating insight into the history, the alternatives, your thinking processes, um, and uh, recommend everybody to go and look out um, Max's website, which you'll Max, the website name is? UMAP Central. Um, hang on. UMAPCentral.com, is that? Yeah. Yeah, it's not on the first slide. That was, yeah. Yeah. That's good to me. Go, go and have a look at that. And you'll get you'll get references to his writings and his uh, and his books, which are really worth reading. Because as information designers, we're all slightly obsessive about something. Um, but to see the just the thorough thinking that 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 Max has put into uh, into the tube map is is really astonishing and uh, and inspiring. So thanks very much uh, very much, Max, for fantastic uh, talk and discussion. Thanks everybody for. Uh, for joining us well can i just um, ask one last question rob oh okay <laughs> well, one very last question sorry i, I just uh, wondering um i was just wondering max whether you ever met up with ken garland did you have you had contact with him had you talked to him did you in your in your researches was that something you ever did i have and they didn't go well unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> am i surprised <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> well, thanks for that moving on <laughs> I, I just wanted moving to on. also give a give a quick plug to the next talk in this series which is stefania passera talking about uh, legal design legal information design uh it's the 2nd of march same same time and um, so, you know, we're, we're just moving on to a different topic. And please do join us again. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Thanks again to Max. Thank you, Max. And well done. With that, we can, I don't know how we applaud, really, because he's still got his slides up. You can't see us, but uh, yeah. Thanks so much. There's an icon for that, isn't there? There is an icon, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot. Right. Bye. Bye. Uh, triple ID people, board members, is